welcome to this Twitter space hosted by Dialectics. Our discussion today is about Africa with a focus on Ghana. I'm Ruth Selom Akolaje. And I'm Andrew Stoku. Uh, welcome to Understanding Africa. And we look forward to an exciting first episode of what will become a series of events. Let's get to know our host organization. Dialectics is a not-for-profit debate organization focused on promoting and upholding quality debates within the African and global debate community. Our projects so far have been the Dialectics Bootcamp, a series of dialectics tournaments and several workshops which have trained hundreds of young people across the globe to harness their critical thinking and practical reasoning skills. This year, we have an even more exciting program lineup, so don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Dialectics to get first days on everything. Now to us, your hosts. Ruth Salom is a Kennedy Luger Youth Exchange and Study Aluminous and a Turkish Buzlari Scholar, majoring in journalism at the Marmar University. Salom began debating in 2020, and in less than three years, she has broken as a judge at both the World Schools Debating Championship and the World Investors Debating Championship, and recently broke barriers, having been the first West African to judge the Open Grand Final of the World Investors Debating Championship. She did not stop there. She has since been a member of the World Schools Debating Championship Board as the first and only West African, making sure Africa is well represented in the global debating circuit. Andy, having six years of competitive debating experience, has developed to become one of Africa's leading debaters on the world stage. He's most noted for his appearance in the grand final of almost every major debate competition he has attended. With more than seven debating trophies in his cabinet, including the London Open Debating Championship, the IIT Bombay Debating Championship, and the Western IV Championship, Andy, having risen to the top of the debating world, is now channeling his efforts into the growth of dialectics. As a 2023 Doha Debate Ambassador, he continues to develop his moderation and facilitation skills. He currently works with the Merchants Operations team at both Ghana and is looking forward to exploring what the future holds for him in the tech and mobility world. Now let's get on with understanding Africa. Africa has a rich history of liberation movements that fought against colonialism and apartheid regimes. So these movements played a crucial role in shaping Africa's political landscape. Now, how much impact do they have on Africa's current political structure? In this episode, we would explore this question by taking a closer look at the Ghanaian story. Ghana was the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to gain independence from colonial rule in 1957. The independence movement in Ghana led by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was an inspiration to other liberation movements on the continent. Now, Ghana's independence was sig a significant milestone, not only for Ghana, but Africa as a whole. And in over six decades, uh, independence, after independence, Ghana's political landscape has undergone um, significant shifts, which are some of the things we'll be discussing in this episode. So from the first republic under Dr. Kwame Nkrumah to the current republic, Ghana has experienced various political systems, including military regimes and democratic governments. Today, we'll evaluate the influence of Ghana's liberation movement on its current political structure and explore the successes, challenges, and opportunities for improvement in Ghana's political system. We'll also examine the impacts of Ghana's political experience on other African countries. We do have a panel of experts in African politics and history who lead the conversation and share their insights on this topic. We we'll also welcome questions and comments from the audience, so please feel free to participate and engage with us. Thank you for joining us, and let's begin with an introduction of our speakers. So prior to that, let's talk about the theme for this episode. The theme for this episode is evaluating the influence of liberation movements on Africa's political structure with a focus on the Ghanaian story. In this episode, we'll cover four key segments in which we'll discuss the conditions and stories that ignited the fight for liberation in Ghana, the key defining moments in Ghana's liberation struggle and their effects on our current political structure. 
we'll talk about how the Ghanaian political system can evolve beyond the limitations imposed by our liberation struggle, and finally share some thoughts on what Independence Day celebrations should mean to us as a people, seeing as tomorrow is our 66th Independence Day celebration. Now let's get to know our speakers. Our first speaker is none other than Solomon Omani Mensa. Solomon holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Ghana and is currently enrolled in the University of Ghana School of Law as a post first degree student. While in his undergraduate years, he was an avid debater and president of the university's debate club in 2019-2020. He has extensive experience in British parliamentary debating at the Ghanaian, Pan-African and the World University's Championship alongside a number of laurels. Solomon is a communications secretary for Pitch Hub Ghana and Cup Group Group and works as a freelance writer and communications consultant for some political personalities. He loves local and international politics and discussions on socioeconomic and cultural matters. Solomon, welcome. Yeah, so moving on to our second speaker. Um, our second speaker goes by the name Eroni Aite Kome. Now, Aaron, who has his long name usually shortened to Nikome, is a graduate of the University of Ghana, where he had his BA and MPhil in African Studies. He aspires to be an academic with interest in African um, social systems, African politics, African literature, and Pan-Africanism. He also has his teaching experiences in colleges of education in Ghana and is currently undertaking further studies. Um, Ni, you are welcome to this episode. Before we go on to the final speaker of the day, I would like to hear some comments from you, Ni, on your expectations for this discussion and also what it means for you to live in a post-colonial Ghanaian era. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Okay, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to an informative and exciting discussion with other very intelligent and brilliant people on the state of our country um, 66 years after independence, and especially in relation to the African continent and the um, topic of liberation movements. So I look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. Um but I think we were having a few glitches when you were speaking, so we'll be glad if you can have a look at that for us as well. Uh, to our third speaker of the day, um, our third speaker is Mr. Karij Nobi. Now, Karij Nobi is a Christian politician and an educator with interest in leadership and youth development with a special interest in history. Presently, he serves as a member of the National Communications Team of the New Patriotic Party. He has extensive experience in education where he teaches language and literature and theory of knowledge in both international baccalaureate and Cambridge programs. He engages in youth capacity building programs through which he has facilitated capacity building for young people and students for over a decade. He holds a master's degree in leadership from the University of Professional Studies, Accra, and a bachelor's degree in English with psychology from the University of Ghana. He's married with a lovely daughter. Um, Courage, you are welcome to this session. I sent you an invitation as a speaker, so please accept so you can speak. Um, we are delighted to have you, and we are delighted that you could join us today. I think what I would also ask is your expectations of this discussion and what you look forward to uncovering. Um, yeah, courage. Uh, if you are speaking, we can't hear you now, so okay. you can unmute. All right. Hello, everybody. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it's it's exciting to be part of this uh, conversation. I think now more than ever, um, there's a need to <clears throat> take an introspective look at our nation and its independence and what it means for us, particularly as young people. Uh, entering into the new era of global development um, for, for our time. So I'm excited to be here and I'm looking forward to accelerating conversation 
that will lead to us all learning something new. Thank you. Thank you very much, Courage, and we also look forward to having you. Um, the final person I'd briefly like to introduce is Abdul Karim, who is here. He's a journalist and also has in-depth knowledge on the discussion. Um, now, I think this is a good time to flag that Solomon would be running late a bit because he's um, stuck in traffic, unfortunately. And so in some instances, we would hop on Karim to pitch in on a few of the discussions that we have in. Awesome. Awesome. Great. So we'll begin the conversation, um, and I'll take the first segment um, where I'll facilitate the discussion for this segment. In this segment, we will talk about the conditions and stories that ignited the fight for liberation in Ghana. And interestingly, I would like to give a brief account from the speech Dr. Kwame Nkrumah gave on the eve of 7th March 1957. Now, in that speech, he expressed the desire to create an African personality and identity that would be respected. And that was essentially what lay at the core of the liberation fight for Ghana as a country. To paraphrase him, the desire was to usher into the world new Africans who were ready to fight their own battles and are capable of managing their own affairs. Right. So before I talk a little bit more about the stories and how powerful they were with courage, let me start with you, Ni. I'm sure there were quite unique conditions during the colonial era, but can you tell us how the conditions, which we all know were bad, created the desire to fight for the liberation of the Ghanaian people? Okay. And um, thank you once again. And I hope the glitches are solved this time around. Um, and I think in the introduction, I thought to add that I'm, I'm, I'm an Nkumaist by, by training by ideology and academically. So the movements had always been there once the slave trade, once the business trade, which um, started in the second half of the 15th century, turned into um, kind of like a, a fist things where there were always battles between the wanted to be colonialism, where imperialism set in, and where capitalism also set in. Then all across the continent, from the um, Congo region to the to the Senegambia region, to the Sahel, anywhere where the slave trade went on, the resistance movements grew. So we know of famous things like the Ashantis, the war of the Kude Kwamu war, we know of the Abba women's riots and many other things that had gone on um, in, the, in times past between the periods of the 15th century to the late 20th century. All these things that were going on um, after from the, these riots that were going on from the slave trade era culminated in the independence struggle when the slave trade ended and came along with colonialism. The Africans then had um, some hard experiences outside and if they saw that well, the way they viewed the white man was not just the way he was. He also had plans running through his veins. And they felt it was time for them to manage their own affairs. They felt they had their own systems, political systems, social systems that had been truncated. Indeed, um, Ngugi Wathiungu uh, says that the white man came with the Bible in his hand. And um, the, man, the African had a land in his hand and told us to close our eyes and pray. And when you open their eyes, the white man had a land in his hand and the black man had a Bible. And so it actually expresses this in many ways, that if the white man wasn't hungry, he wouldn't have left his house to come and dry his shirt in the black man's land. And so once there, once there was a certain excess of consciousness in most of the strong kingdoms that used to resist these things, the Mali Empire, the Ghanaian Empire, the Kikungu Empire, the Zulu Kingdom, the um, old um, the Benin Empire had all fallen. It was left with kind of like neo-colonialist or um, citizens in those days to rise up and start fighting. And most of them had become educated in the language of the white man and the thinking and reason of them. And once they had developed ideologies, they felt it was time for them to kick this person out. And so once it started in Haiti in the late 19th century, and the civil rights resistance movement started in America. The resistance against slave trade started. Then some of these people came from here 
going to steady the, the likes of John Mercer, Saba, Casey Hayford, eventually Kwame Nkrumah, um, J.B. Dankwa Kwaji, and etc. We <clears throat> saw so the influence that went. When we read the comments, we talk about the influence that, um, that um, the gentleman, the man on the five CD notes, um, his name has just escaped me, had on his life. And so you see the likes of people like um, Ben and John Nani Azikwe. So you said there was a consciousness that had awoken. And once the consciousness had awoken, Nkrumah was of the view that it was right to awaken the consciousness of the nation, the consciousness of everyone. There's one thing that Nkrumah says, which is a speech he gave at the Palladium House in uh, February 1948, just before he broke away from the UGCC, where his bus had ridden it. And his car had broken down from Salt Moon on his way to the Palladium House in Accra. And Dankwa had just had just managed the crowd but he even though it was six hours a crowd had been there he said it was at that point that he understood that the people were having a certain sense of consciousness that they wanted this thing to be done and then they knew that well if everyone will feel you in the words of jb dankwa kwam kuma will never feel you and so eventually there were all these moments i think the first half of the 20th century in the words of um, wed was was a century of was the movement of was the liberation era. Everyone, everywhere, it was a spirit that was running to. And don't forget, after the Second World War, the India, the British Empire fell in India, and what they felt the sun was setting on the empire had started. And so they took inspiration from what was going on in India, what had gone on in America with the likes of um, the likes of uh, um, the, the Pan-Africanist, um, George Patmore, people like George Patmore, and then, um, Sorry, the news, the news keeps keeping up my mind when it comes back on. But they took inspiration from them and they come they came back to their continent and they tried to look the liberation movement. So this were this was what how the movement started and what brought about these things in the um, first half of the twentieth century just gone by. Thank you. That's very much interesting to, to know, specifically because it, a, a huge part of it per your account is, is boiling down to consciousness and the power of the mind and the fact that people realize that they could now take matters into their own hands and govern themselves. Now, let's come to you, Courage. Um, how powerful do you think the liberation stories that motivate people to fight were? Because to move a population of over 6 million people at a time to believe in the liberation cause that I think from the start would have seemed impossible, the message must have been very convincing, must have resonated with every single one of them. So can you give us an account of some of the stories and how powerful you think they were in governing people? All right, thank you very much, um, Andy. I think, um, thank you, Ni, for that uh, very good run through of all the incidents at the time. I would probably want us to take it even a little further or take it from an earlier time. Um, you realize that historically, uh, black Africans or sub-Saharan Africans were originally the builders of the Egyptian empire thousands of years before what we later came to see as the Mali empire and others, which resulted from the various onslaught, first onslaught at the hands of the Arab Arabians, then the European invasion or both of which they withstood. It was, I think, the second Arabic invasion that intelligence had it that it was too great to withstand. So our ancestors decided to now migrate down south. Now, where were they in the area called Egypt, which is bigger than our current uh, demarcated Egypt? It included places like uh, Algeria, Libya, Sudan, and all of that. These were 46 along the Nile. And if you check settlement studies, you realize that um, local societies settle along particularly water bodies, you know, because of the fertile soil in the peninsula or in the, in the banks that they can farm on. And then also the rich resources from the water fish and also for it as a source of transport. So that is where a majority of what we now know as Sub-Saharan Africa was. And when they decided to migrate down south, as a defense mechanism against going extinct, they moved in what we call the seven migrations. There is only one group, one local group 
that decided that no, this is our ancestral land and we are not moving anywhere. And that is those that we refer to today as the South Sudanese. So if you check, apart from the South Sudanese, practically everybody in North Africa today is an immigrant, i.e. Arabic, Arabian immigrant who occupy the space. So if you've ever been to any of the great pyramids of Egypt, and let me just say that there are actually more pyramids even in Sudan than in Egypt, you realize that they are very disconnected from the history. It's just a means of money making for them, as a, for tourism for them for now, but they cannot identify with the history of how it was built, how it came to be, and that is because they do not have it and they do not own it. So from that came down to smaller empires that uh, Ni referred to, the Mali Empire, Songhai, uh, Ghana Empire. And that migration also led to a loss of a lot of technology, a lot of science, loss of science, even loss of culture and others. If just a few remained, just a few remained. So by the time of the 20th century, by the 20th century, we had seen a completely different build-up of society, a completely different. But the late 19th century had it such that the British, who had been adding value to their cotton, which hitherto they exported to Italy for making clothes, and and I think Victoria the first, they decided that no, they needed to build industry, they needed to employ their people. So they started adding value, beginning from about 10%, to 20, 40, 50, to the extent that now they could add 100% value to their cotton and needed additional raw materials, decided to move in search of raw material. So it was part of that, those voyages that led to um, the, is it Don Diego de Azambuja or so, coming to docking at Elmina and, in quote, discovering Ghana, discovering Ghana in quote, you know, because you don't discover any space. The spaces already exist with its culture and everything. Now, they started with trade and it became more brutal as greed, which is known with every trade and capitalism set in, said that the trade now extended to human trade. We saw that phase brutally um, with a lot of Africans shipped across the, the oceans. And that led us to the point where the first battle to end slavery took place. But something fantastic happened in this time, and that is that there were kings who became, made themselves merchants of slaves, you know, and in that they became the suppliers of slaves. In fact, most of them were honored by the crown, so that if you hear titles like Nanase, Nana se, nana se, it means that this was practically a monarch or a ruler in any segment of the country who collaborated with the trade which enriched the British. And for doing that, they were honored by the crown. You know, I don't see anything prestigious in it, but if we don't know it, then we think that it is prestigious. And in school, we were taught that these were actually good achievements, but they were not. Then the early 20th, early 20th century had now the white beginning to tackle land, making attempts at owning land. So we saw the first movement, a nationalist movement, which was the Aborigines Right Protection Society. The Aborigines Right Protection Society, mainly saying that we need to rise up to protect our lands, to protect the rights of indigenes over their lands. If you check the land tenure system in Ghana and other species, you realize that it is quite unique because that movement succeeded. So, but that became the first symbol of a nationalist movement. Its achievement spurred later movements on when the UGCC in, I think, 1947 constituted itself into uh, somewhat of, an, uh, of, an, of, of a, 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 a struggle or a movement for independence a movement for independence. But again, these were mainly the descendants or the relatives of the palaces. These are people who came from the palaces, who were collaborators with the British. And so as much as possible, they did not want to do anything to upset 
their benefactors. In fact, um, there's one prince in Anumabo whom the chief, after selling the slaves, gave the prince to the captain to ensure that he goes to receive education outside. Unfortunately, that ship was attacked and that prince got lost in the struggle. That prince of that king of Anumabo, or chief of Anumabo, stopped the slave trade until he was found somewhere in France. Until the prince was found, he made sure there was no slave trade. And when the prince was found, trade resumed. So, it, in fact, his descendants is what we call, if you know, the was in says, the was in says of Anumabo, that is the line. So, these were the kind of people who constituted the UGCC. Uh, put together by a George Power Grant, Power Grant, who was a merchant, a timber merchant. And at the time, you could not really be involved in business if you're not related to the ruling class. You know, put them together. It was in the course of this that a brilliant young man who had left the shores of this country to America first. And the significance of that, if you read his own book, Conscientism, Conscientism, he makes the point that and his consciousness raised the question that if you are under subjugation by a people, such as the British, you cannot hope to be empowered by the same people. And that is why he made a choice to go to America, which at the time had had its own colonial history. And the Black Liberation Movement was also very strife with people like our Jamaican uh, brother, Marcus Garvey, and his revolutionary movement happening there. So he saw that you know, what was happening in this space could really, really empower me. And that's why he went there, got educated in a black university, you know, became a yeah. professor there and was really helping there until he head of the Faith Pan-African Conference of 1945 in the UK and yeah. volunteered to be part of the organizing team. And his brilliance, so yes. Yeah, courage. I'd like to ask a much more specific question here. Now, after Nkrumah's exploits, um, when he came back to Ghana, what was the specific narrative he came back with? Was it that he had found out that they can't manage their own affairs? Was it that he had to take time to instill that consciousness? What were the specific things he had to tell the Ghanaians across the various regions to support his dream? All right. So when he came back, and upon the recommendation of Akwa J and joined the ranks and he was made general secretary. And here I will single out that the powerful place of the general secretary in our political parties today is because of the legacy of Kwame Nkrumah as general secretary of the UGCC. Became very, very administratively robust and organizing and mobilizing the people. Now, he had tasted what happened in America you know, had seen the all, practically all the ills of colonialism and knew that it is part of the innate quality of a human being to have freedom. But you realize that these were people who were impoverished, a people who had suffered under the brute force of colonialism. So he needed to awaken those sentiments for freedom in them. And he decided to deal with no other yeah. group than the youth group, the young population, just like we are doing here today. You know? Now he realized that the youth groups were organized already in their various communities okay. in what we call the Asafu companies. And okay. these were a collection of young people who served as a defense militia or a, a, a paramilitary organization in their societies to ensure law and order. So he now yeah. contacted these people and started raising their consciousness about the necessity of being a free human being. Freedom as a right. So if you read his book, I yeah. Speak Freedom, you see that he's, he, he explains the sentiment in there. You know, that, that yeah. every human being is supposed to be a free bird. Fortunately for him, awesome. and due to his humility, an ability to connect with these young people. They all mm -hmm. accepted the message overwhelmingly. He then instituted okay. those Asafu companies as chapters of the UGCC. Okay, okay. That's, that's good to really understand. 
I think um, when Salom comes, we'll delve much deeper into the specific incidents and how he weaponized these companies in driving out um, the kind of fight um, against the colonial rulers. But I would like to ask Karim to pitch in here on a very interesting aspect of Nkrumah's speech that I came across. That um, in Nkrumah's speech, he made mention of God and the fact that the independence of Ghana was destined by God. Now, most of us know the role religion is purported to have played in initiating and sustaining colonization in Ghana, right? I guess the more interesting question I have here for Karim is, how vital was the role of religion and the God narrative in mobilizing our people during the struggle for independence? Well, thank you very much, Andrews. And yeah, this is, this is a rather very interesting um, dimension to, to this conversation. Um, I should say that, uh, well, if one looks at Nkrumah himself, and, and I am stuttering a little here because um, because it is directly a question about about impact, one has to be very careful to to be able to draw the the right correlation between the events, yeah. uh, so as not to also perhaps create a certain false impression of of the value or the impact of of religion. I mean, when you look at the subject of religion, there are, I guess, many ways that one can one can look at it. Uh, in the sense that one can look at it from the perspective of what religion meant for, say, the average, maybe then you won't call them Ghanaians, but yes, everybody yeah. within that, that territory, and how the, the sort of relationship that had been created as a result of religion between missionaries who are, by extension, part of the colonial establishment or agenda, and then yeah. if you take, for instance, somebody like um, Kwame Nkrumah, who was leading uh, the campaign at the time, and his own place within the, the, the Christendom, or I mean, his faith, it's, it is very well known that he himself was, was, was one of, of faith. And so maybe are, when you look at yeah. it from that perspective, if you tie that in with, the, with, with, with liberation struggles, the question that would arise is whether or not it was more difficult trying to get people to appreciate what a new world may look like yeah. if you consider the fact that there are all of those entanglements that come with religion. But then again, if it is also specifically about what impact religion had on, on, on the independence struggle, I mean, from where I sit, I, I would not put so much emphasis on that or so much, I mean, essence on that. Because if I look at all the most important indicators or factors that culminated into the sort of force that we saw that brought uh, some pressure upon the, the colonialists to, to, to essentially run away, um, I, I do not think that religion was as strong in there. However, I think that it was as important as any other social institution in the way that uh, it was a, a, a galvan, gal, galvanizing tool, basically. So, for instance, if you look at okay. what Nkrumah, especially and uh, Nambi Azikewe in Nigeria, did in their yeah. respective spaces, they use sports as an institution, organized, I mean, major events, football games, among other things like that, to to rally support. And I think that to that extent, yeah. one can say that when people mobilize themselves around the idea of religion, that in itself could be a space that you can easily tap into. But I am not very sure if one can point to specific things about religion as in an intrinsic aspect of, say, Christianity, say, Islam, say, other forms of African traditional uh, systems, that in themselves lend any credence to the independence struggle. I, I am not sure if, if that connection is, is as strong, but I can see yeah. how the, the spaces and institutions could become very useful for, for mobilization. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, in my research for this episode, um, listening to Nkrumah's speech, that was one line that, that struck a nerve. 
because I listened to that speech over and over again. I've understood that he recognized the struggle, the desire, the hope, but very little did I notice um, that at some point he made mention of um, a God-appointed time, the destiny that God had for these people and how it resonated with the people. So in my thoughts, it was more like, him weaponizing the very tool that was used to colonize us to in some way galvanize support at some point in time. And I think you, you clarify that as it being a mobilizing tool, just like any other social institution. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now that concludes the first part of the discussion, Salom will take over from here and moderate the next segment. Thank you very much, Andy. For this next segment, we're going to look at the key defining moments during the liberation struggle and then examine some of the impacts that they have on our political structure in status quo. Of course, there are several stories and conditions that ignited the fight for liberation within social justice movements in Ghana. We've heard of the sovereignty war, the Bond of 1844, and many other ones. Me, can you shed more light on some of these key moments and what your thoughts are on whether they do still have an impact on our political structures than end? Okay, <clears throat> thank you once again. And um, before I do, I'd like to touch on the last question this book about religion and when Nkrumah spoke about that. And um, we all know that the history of Nkrumah's religion that when Nkrumah went, first went to um, Lincoln, he was a preacher and he, he in fact studied theology <clears throat> sorry so he had his influences basically in public he built his public speaking let's say through preaching in congregations but let's also not forget that um at the opening of Inkuma in his own autobiography mentioned that there are three things he really feared the most for the sake of a man he mentioned his fear of women he mentioned his fear of money and his fear of organized and obligatory religion. And when he said that, he said he felt that he, the thing with religion for him is that he feels it, it, it can kind of trap him. Not that he doesn't believe in it, but an organized and obligatory religion has a sense of entrapment, a sense that can, can temper with man's thinking, if I'm to paraphrase what he says. And um, I think he in his identity, cultural identity promotion, or kind of like his cultural identity, he he acknowledged when he used God, it wasn't necessarily the God of the colonialist. Don't forget that at the opening of the Parliament House, he called upon the most popular chief priests in the whole country, William from Accra, some people from the Hota region, some Ashanti chief priests, linguist chief priests, sorry, and some from the north, to pour libation at the steps of the parliament house even before he entered so i think um that was the sense in which he viewed religion and in other things when you read the um the ghana at one memoir published by the um, graphic communications you realize that you know, he acknowledges the contribution of them but he also has their challenges he has with them to the substantive question of what some of the rules were that were played i think the most important influential thing was um, the bond of 1844 not that the bond itself was influenced, was critical, but um, was was critical to Nkrumah, that's what I mean. But the significance of it, the, I mean, that was the whole significance of the Sith March. That is why in after September 1956, when Ghana was clear on the path to independence, and they had to choose a date, they, wait, they had to wait three, four months to choose Sith March 1957, because they wanted the significance of the Sith March to, to, to be significant, to matter in their life history, to be to be the name of Ghana's um, struggle, <clears throat> that everything that would do would stem from there. Because on Sith March 1844, what happened changed the dynamics of the colonial struggle. The, the kind of way they were coiled, the traditional rulers were coiled into sending something that they probably didn't understand the terms fully but about a whole new dimension of the formation of what we have presently called Ghana, even before the um, the, the German conference, the Berlin Conference of 18, 1887 to 1888. That said, it would have changed the land struggle, but for people like John Mercer Saba. That said, it would have changed 
the way the relations were done, the way the, the way the British took over, if the bond was inside. And so these things, once there was once they started from a cooperation, what psychologists would call a foot in the door approach, it was then going to spread into what had this land settlement we call Ghana today. And so I think that is probably the most significant day, aside the other dates that happened um, 1901, 1902, 1903, etc. So if there's any landmark that I put there as the beginning of um, where the history starts and where we can get to know the liberation, who we start fighting, who the, who the opponent is or who the enemy is, I'll take it back to St. March 1844. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insightful remark, Lee. That was very interesting, particularly your remarks on Dr. Nkrumah viewing religion through the lens of entrapment. And it does make me wonder if how we as Ghanaians view religion in status quo would have been any different had Nkrumah stayed in power long enough. Once again, thank you very much. Moving on then to Karim, we've also heard about the 1948 Accra riots, the, the campaign for independence from British rule, and the Global Nonviolence Action Database. What are your thoughts on how these things have shaped our politics as Ghanaians? Well, again, I think it depends on the, on the period that one, one looks at any of these things uh, from. Um, and and for me, I I I, I am I am more a, a contemporary I mean, person. If I could periodize my interest in that way, as opposed to uh, say the history. Uh, when it comes to history, people like me are, are the gurus in in, in 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 the space. And of course, my senior uh, has also been been dwelling a lot on that. But but of course, there there have been different periods or or, or issues or events that. Uh, independent struggle leaders picked inspiration from. When we talk about Ghana, we are often talking about uh, outside the Fokwam and Chroma, and and it is not a secret the kind of um, um, I mean inspiration that he drew, uh, for instance, from what was pe- uh, happening in other spaces or jurisdictions. If you look at Ghana's historical relationship with um, India, uh, you would see very much that. There are some elements that we draw from what Mahatma Gandhi uh, was doing there in India, governizing his own people, among other things like that. And so, yes, the question of of nonviolence has always been part of independence struggle and, and debates. Even today, we continue to have debates like that, and that is why it is often very interesting to me um, when um, young people, or generally people, are, are protesting. Uh, some of the things that we are going through currently, and then we are told that there's a certain way, orientation, style, approach that we must all uh, embark upon. And the interesting bit also is that if you look at some of the key moments uh, during the, the independence struggle uh, era, if you look, for instance, at the, the three ex-servicemen who, after doing their part of a contract with the, with the British colonialists, returned home and were not able to, or were not given what was due them and all of that. If you look at the protest that they embarked upon, which led to their killing uh, in such gruesome manner, you can draw some sentences from that period and even what is happening currently. And that is why it is always very important to look at our independence struggle in a certain continuum and not be under any illusions that everything has ended. Everything would end if you look at the, the goals, the aspirations that were set, right? And, and, and today, very recently, we saw our, our pensioners who had done uh, what they must do for this country, uh, retired, and, and what is now due them is being taken away somehow. It is very different in the way that it has happened, but it is also very similar in the way that it has happened sometime in the past. And then we saw them also go out there just like the uh, ex-servicemen went out there to protest. Yes, this time around, they were not shot and killed. But for me, those are some of the lessons and the, and the examples that one can draw from them. So there are, there are just about many things that one can point to and say that given the, the similarities in terms of the, the goals that were set and all of that, 
we have learned from all of them. But the question at the end of the day really is, what did the independence struggle leave with us in this current generation? What is our approach, our attitude, our orientation towards protest? If we find that our own leaders, our, the, the authorities of, of the day, are acting in ways that do not yield or lead us to the aspirations that were set at the point of independence and all of that, what do we do about it, right? And for me, that is where the revisionist uh, approach that often comes to the way we do things must be engaged and interrogated uh, very seriously. Again, and just to round up on this one, in the, 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 the philosophical positions where the people come from also influence the way they come to bear on some of these matters. And for me, it is, it is not surprising that the elites of Ghana and by extension Africa, who immediately post independence, if I could say it like that, benefited from the vacuum that was rightfully created as a result of the, the sacking, if, if you will call it that, of, of the colonialists. If you look at them, you would see that they have not really entirely departed so much from, from some of the things that we are agitating against. And that is why today you would have a president who, by all intents and purposes, have enjoyed the goodies of this country because his line, his father, the immediate people that he comes from, for instance, were some of those who benefited from the, the vacuum that was created. And the very many other people as well. So when you look at that, you appreciate why they seem to be so antagonistic when it comes to especially young people going out there, venting their spleen, protesting and demanding for what it is, is, is um, very necessary or, or what is our right. Okay, so, so for me, this is how I look at it. The relationship was there, the correlation is there, we drew some examples from there and all of that. But today, if Nkrumah, for instance, woke up today right now to look at Ghana, I know this is a cliche, I'm sure he, he, he would find things very bizarre and very difficult to believe because I don't suspect that that is the kind of world that they left at that point. But today, we seem to have been cowed into, into silence in many ways and protest, we are told, is not part of our culture. We are, we are supposed to be docile, very calm, very humble, very nice about things and all of that. That is not our history. That's not our experience. Thank you very much for that time. We really do appreciate that input. You literally took the words out of my mouth because looking back just a few years ago, there were several incidents within the political structure of Ghana that necessitated protests and other actions that citizens were in their right to actually take. But more often than not, the police and law enforcement were used to just push us back and prevents us from taking those actions. So moving forward into the conversation, Courage, I would also like to hear your thoughts on whether we should continue to necessitate or take part in these protests, or you think that we should just go forward with how we've been pushed back to remain docile, as Karim just said. All right, thank you very much, um, Salom. And um, just a, a slight quick take on some of the comments by my fellow panelists. Um, I think many a times we refer to some of the incidents that occurred in our history with colonial language. For example, we keep on saying the 1948 riots or disturbances, which was rather an uprising. You know? So you would realize that the perspective to the discussion in itself does not empower so that if New Kabnaboni leading the people in an uprising, rightly so, and we could, because the colonialists termed it as a riot or as a disturbance of the colonial order, in 2023, we continue to have that same language in our textbooks and we use that same language to describe our phenomena, then it, it psychologically affects. So if you're telling a young person in SHS, to pick it or to take an action, he, he or she sees it more in a negative light rather than the positive light for which it, it should be. You know, so I just wanted to note that. And also to note that 
not religion, but spirituality is a force. And the reality of spirituality in our everyday lives uh, cannot be overemphasized. So when you have someone like Nkrumah, who was a deeply spiritual person, and, and he was a Christian by all intents and purposes. He writes about it. He talks about it. He was a deeply prayerful person. In fact, I had the rare privilege of learning from one of his security detail who showed me a spot in Accra where at 3 p.m. each day, Nkrumah would go to pray. So he was a deeply spiritual person who appreciated that. But again, he was also a politician who liked the nuance of balance. So like Karim did say, at the opening of the first parliament, he would allow the traditionalists to perform their rights as well. But in the chamber itself, and before that time, there had been an Anglican mass to dedicate the land to God, you know, i.e. the Christian God, you know, as we understand it to be. And what part of the psychological challenges that Nkrumah himself would have much later would be, where do I place my Christianity and, and the traditional society, uh, religions in all of this, all of these, because he got to a point where he had certain, so, but since that's not the focus for today, I will then uh, move. So you realize that all those happenings, in as much as they gave us independence, you know, immediately we had independence, we did not have the requisite mean, uh, manpower to develop. So again, Nkrumah makes a decision of sending young people to Russia instead of to the colonial master's place because of the impact that he thought it would have, you know, to train. And true to his hunch, Kotoka, whom he sent on a scholarship to the UK at Sandhurst, was the one that became the tool of the colonialist to constitute a coup against him. For me, it's an affront on us that up to today, we continue to name Accra, the international airport, after Kotoka, who was a coup maker. And yet when young people want to go on a demonstration or something, we clamp down on it. Because if you are celebrating a coup maker, you are celebrating someone who, uh, how do you call it, by the barrel of the gun, unseated the government, you are telling us that it is the right thing to do. It is a way to go about change. You know, it, I think we probably would have to investigate how come we don't have violent uh, uprising in this country from the way we celebrate uh, coup makers uh, in this country. You know, much later, we'll, Rollins will be called lit, uh, Junior Jesus or Little Jesus, you know, also stemming from all of that. Then you realize that in contemporary times, I think uh, former President Mahama said that we are people of short memory, and it seems to be so. So in the instance, we think that, okay, this uprising or this will be good for us and we we'll do it. And just when we have freedom, just when we seem to be thriving, we forget. We forget. And it makes positioning within a society very difficult. Can we make reference to the police service today? I think in 2007, I sat in a public lecture addressed by the, this legal alumni, Professor Ramona Tukuba in which he disclosed that when he checks with the police service, the manual that was used to train the Ghana police force at the time was the 1927 colonial police manual. 1927 colonial police manual. As of 2007, 50 years on, it was the same manual. Then you realize that the ruling class that took over whether it was the First Republic or Buzia the Second or the Wickham, were really not interested in any significant structural change. They weren't. All they sought to do was to occupy the place of the colonizer. It is symbolized in the use of the castle as a seat of government at the time. And even in the church, if you check the way the church runs, because in the colonial church, it was the white man sitting on a dais, even the white members, before the members, the, the black members or the Ghanaian members were on a lower level sitting down. If you see the design of our churches, even up to today, you know, we continue to emphasize that human differential, which is actually not reflective 
of the Christian faith that I belong to. You know, so you see the impact in every aspect of, of our living. And that is very, very, it's something that for us as young people, we need to interrogate and begin to take initiatives to change. On the economy, which is very, very important, apart from our first republic in Kroma, and maybe much later, a champion who really and truly did something to change the structure of the economy from what we call the Gorgesbeck economy, where you export jobs by exporting raw materials to the European capitals, where they used to create jobs and then export finished goods to you at exorbitant prices and all of that. Apart from Nkrumah, we've not seen any significant um, attempt at changing it. And that is why even in the 21st century today, from 2001, 2002 in particular, and Ghana, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and Russia are in a war and we are suffering because the, the price of grains have shot up. Meanwhile, we continue to export cocoa raw, export our gold raw, export our bauxite and magnesium raw, except now that they've now decided to build an industrial complex around bauxite. So they've changed the law that makes it illegal to do so, and that is just uh, 2019. So structurally, we've not learned from the liberation movement much, and that is because of the early truncation of the Nkrumah government, I believe. Intellectually, if you look at it, his approach, perspective, his philosophy to governance was truly anti-colonial, was truly liberation. But almost all the governments that have come after him have rather played to the colonial powers. Hence, um, establishment that we have with our society today and everything. Most of the people we celebrate as businessmen in this country are nothing but importers of European goods and selling them. And so we have more and more young people being unemployed because of the truncation of our liberation struggle. Thank you. That was particularly educated, Farage. It's intriguing the way our use of language in reference to these situations has such a huge impact on how we view individuals fighting for our best interests. That is a very important topic and I believe we should have an entire segment on that. Once again, thank you very much for that insight. And that brings us to the end of the second segment. Andy will now take over with the third segment. Um, so it's been interesting sitting behind and listening a lot uh, because I'm really, really getting to soak in all the things that have been said here, and it's nice to be a listener on this piece. Um, in this third segment, we will discuss how the Ghanaian political system can evolve beyond the, some of the limitations that we've identified. But in doing that, I would just like to initiate this discussion with a brief description of some of the limitations. We'll have a brief chat about them and then transition gradually to exactly how we can deal with them. So after the independence struggle in which we were told the stories of the God appointed time, future prosperity, and we were promised the true experience of freedom, joy, quality living, and all that, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah began to institute totalitarian measures so he could achieve his economic dream of an industrialized socialist state. Um, he made key power consolidating reforms in 1964 when he declared himself president for life and changed the constitution so that Ghana became a one-party state. Now, these new reforms were in no way a fulfillment of some of the promises that were made during the liberation struggle and marked the beginning of a shift in public support from Nkrumah and his party, which eventually led to his overthrow, some would say. I have a few questions here, and I would like to start with courage on this one. Assuming Nkrumah had told the people, let's say, what we would call the reality of how things could go post-colonization, that it wouldn't be all joy and riches, but a tough period of rebuilding that would require some democratic sacrifices to stabilize the state and realize our economic dreams, would he have experienced the sharp decline in public support that we saw after the 1964 reforms, which led to his overthrow eventually? Um, Courage, this was to you. Uh, I'm not sure if Courage can hear me.
but I think I would ask me to pitch in on this one, um, just to briefly repeat the question. It's that there were times when Nkrumah slightly drifted away from the, the promises that he made during the, the colonial era, um, the struggle for independence. And my question here is, is it the case that if he had told people the reality and not just sold stories of a good and prosperous future, um, would things have been any different? Okay. Um to start with that, Nkrumah was clear on sit March 1957. Nkrumah was clear about what we need to do, what we needed to do. He was clear that we needed to build a personality. Nkrumah once said that if he wanted to know how good or bad a country is, look at the people's attitude to work. Look at and, and among other things, right? Nkrumah said that we have to go and show the world. When Nkrumah said we have to go and show the world what the African is made of, he said that we have to build a new we would have to go to work. Everybody in the country would have to get to work because we, and this was what he said um, in December 1957, that we would have to work three times as much as the developed countries if we would have to catch up because they are not also not going to stop because we've also had our independence. And so uh, for the mentality in Kuma had, Kuma was clear about, about what he wanted us to do. When you listen to people who were close to Nkrumah and met Nkrumah, people like Martin Luther King, and especially Kwame Ture, Kwame Ture and Mayanje. Kwame Ture once said that Nkrumah had three things that he felt he could build a nation with. One is unity, two is organization, and three is ideology. That, and this, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to also encapsulate the, the, um, the President for Life thing that Nkrumah did, which later on his, his secretary spoke about. That Nkrumah was of the view that it's, and I think time has proven him right. When you look at countries like um, even Ivory Coast, countries like West of like Nigeria, like Guinea, in the whole Sahel, that we are too volatile because of the history of colonialism. The many ethnic groups that come together to form a nation, it, the way we had even gained our independence with the NLM and the CPP and etc., it was too volatile to have had divisions in the country, as maybe people were expecting, the, the opposition was expecting to have as, an, as, a, as America had or as the UK had. And that the divisions were rather going to hinder the progress of the country. So the best thing to do is to have one government where people would, where the arguments would be something like as done in parliament, but under one government with under one leader, and then develop to a certain extent where we will be able to take it from there. Nkuma was so concerned about the united vision of an Africa united, so much so that to have his own country divided on certain frivolous lines, because he knew that once we are going to have democracy, it was going to the country was going to be divided on ethnic lines. And before even before Nkuma died, we also what happened in Nigeria in January 1967. We've all seen what's happened in Congo, we've all seen what happened in Kenya. We've seen what happened in Ivory Coast just in 2011. And so that was in Kuma's ideology for unity that we, we also we didn't have the, the manpower was the intellectual manpower was few. And so having um, being conscious of that, the few manpower, intellectual manpower we had should not even be divided among themselves. They should be united to work towards a common purpose. And that was in Kuma's good. That it's not really about the power. In Kuma said he was really he was ready to relinquish his presidency for the for the betterment of the African continent. So it wasn't really about the power, but it was about the ideology, it was about the thinking, what we wanted to have. Secondly, it was about the organization. And Yukuma spoke so much about organization. Yukuma had been an organizer for the um, Pan-African Congress in Manchester and um, in the Pan-African Congresses in the, of the 1920s and then in the 1940s. Yeah, when he came to the CPP, when he came to the EGCC, he took the seats from two dormant offices into about 200 branches across the country, which was why it was easy for him to have almost the entire country behind him um, when he moved to the CPP, because he had taught the whole country, he had organized the people, he had spoken to them, he spoke to the them a veranda boy, he, sp he spoke to them and told them what it was about. So it was about organization. And that was when Nkrumah became president, when he went to, um, when he, his only speech he titled the African Genius Speech, which he gave at the University of, Institute of African Studies. 
the university of ghana he says in our thinking he said it again and the opening of ghana national there should be thinkers thinkers of great thoughts and doers doers of great deeds for what is your education can help your country in our of need when he did that he said we should when he formed the university of ghana if you see the commerce plan he did it he had the the atomic gun atomic energy he had he had the standard board because he wanted us to have a certain kind of scientific revolution when you read the ghana yearbook the ghana at one yearbook nkuma talks nkuma talks about a scientific a science village a science and research center don't forget in 1958 he took the um, science and research acts to parliament because he wanted us to organize ourselves scientifically he wanted us to organize ourselves culturally, which is why everywhere he traveled, he tra- sometimes he traveled with a band, he traveled with a group of people. He wanted us to organize ourselves sportingly, which is why he formed the Rural Republicans. That the view of these divisions was not necessary. And with the Rural Republicans, it was also vindicated because in Kuma's time, he won the African Cup of Nations twice. So Kuma was very particular about organization. Finally, he was very particular about ideology, the entire thinking of the country. He wanted us to be synced in one way that once we are going this way, we are everybody in the country is on one path. When it, when Nkrumah wanted to build the Akosumu Dam, he spent years. I mean, in, the only time Nkrumah compromised on his principles was when he knew that Kaiser was the only people who could build the Akosumu Dam. And so he would have to give in to an extent to his demands, other than working with um, a capitalist or an anti imperialist, an imperialist. But he knew what he wanted. He, has, he, has, he, he, he spent time taking video centers across the country, telling people that, listen, once we get this done, our revolution begins. We are going to build the industries. We are going to build the schools. And when we build the schools, we are, it's not just about building the schools, but schools with purpose. When he, when he was expanding the colleges of education in Ghana, he said there were no teachers in the country, so they should have free education at that stage, so that the teachers that will be produced could be sent all across the country to build people, to have to think towards a socialist, building a socialist country, a united Africa. When he had, he formed the GBC, the GTV television, he the programs were on it were intentional. That was why at the point in time the, there was a Swahili program on it, and there was intention about news of Africa. Yeah. Everything Nkrumah did was towards after he had brought the unit to an organized, was towards an ideology that we should all have a certain way of thinking about where we want our country to go and what we want our country to do and believe in this thing, not in ideology of differences because the differences were rather going to disintegrate us. Eventually, the differences have disintegrated us and we are more concerned about the thinking on political lines, the thinking on frivolous things, the thinking on tribalist, on, on ethnic centric lines. Don't forget, the, the best, one of the best things you could implemented was the secondary school boarding system policy of mixing people from the country into one place. Because had Nigeria done that, I'm not sure in 2023 it will be one of the key things in Nigeria, whether you are people in Yoruba, or had the Kenyans done that, whether you are Kikuyu, or, or someone, whether even the South Africans, whether you are Osa or you are Zulu. But that thing about improvement being intentional about people from all over the country mixing among themselves, about having a nationalistic agenda, that was why when he when he built when he built a country at first, he spent years of time changing the names of things. One thing Nigeria failed to do, one thing even South Africa failed to do, is the naming because he thought there was a lot of things in the name. Look at the thing when look at the things in Kuman name. In Kuman named when he built universities halls in university, he named the Mensa Saba to send the image out. The schools yeah. he, built, he the, the halls he built, he named things after Kwedri Agri. He named things after women who were of prominence. And so he had an, a conscious ideology about how we should do things. And before I end, um, one of the things when we were talking about the goals and aspirations of independence, when Karim was talking, yeah. was about the struggle. In, in, in turning up with my ideology, Ghana National College was formed in 1948. That was nine years before Ghana's independence. It was yeah. formed as a result of students who were sacked from a fancy school, students and teachers who were sacked from because they had gone in riots towards the independence struggle. Don't forget that at 1948, we were a good host. We we're nine years away from independence. But in Kuma's organization, Kuma's ideology about the kind of country he wanted to build, about the type of way we wanted to go, he told the people that we are going to listen, we are going to build a country. And the country we are going to build is going to be called Ghana. And the Ghana is going to emulate the greatness of the old Ghanaian Empire. And so once these students have come out, we are going to build a school and name the school after the country we want to have. 
and that country we called Ghana. So in 1948, nine years before um, Ghana gained independence, he formed a secondary school and named the school Ghana National College, which is where it's called Osati Full School. This is the vision the man had. This is the ideology the man had. And this is why he wanted the unity of purpose. One of the people, finally, one of the people who was his biggest critics was Julius Nyerere, especially in 1963, when the um, when the Moravian Accord, the Moravian Group won, when he was calling for United Africa. Julius Nyerere came to Ghana um, at Ghana at 40 during the Rolling time. And Julius Nyerere said, use the occasion when he was the guest speaker at the independence celebration to plead for forgiveness of the leaders who had who had who had not been in command. Because Nkuma warned them that together we stand, but divided we, are, we will fall. He, and that the, the forces we fight against are bigger than us. And if we are supposed to fight them individually, one by one, they will drop each and every one of you. Since 1960, since 19, since 1961, when they dropped Patrice Nkuma, they have dropped over 30 African leaders. And the same thing, once you have differences within you, it is easier for you to drop like that. And so, Going forward, in planning our, our in planning our struggle, liberation, in planning our political structures, these are the three tenets that we should focus on: unity of the country, organization of the country, which probably only happens now at political um, party political party level, and the ideology we want to do. Even I keep on saying finally, but please bear me. After improvement, probably the greatest policy we've had has been a champions operation: feed yourselves on the freedom of industries. It was an ideology they had about continuous because we couldn't pay our debt, continuously going to feed ourselves, feed our nation, produce what we eat and eat what we grow. And yeah. so once we are going to get an ideology right, how what are we? Are we building a socialist country? Are we building an anti-imperialist country? Are we building a capitalist country? If that is what you want, we should all be on the same ideological page, and from then we should be able to progress. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting for me to listen to, um, specifically because I see how exciting the Nkrumah dream was and the kind of things he did, the kind of vision and effort and organization he put in there. But this leads right into the next question I have for courage. The next 15 years post Nkrumah's overthrow were a turbulent period of successive military coups. Um, obviously, these coups significantly slowed down our development as a country. But is there anything specific to our liberation campaign that contributed to this? So, for instance, did we set too high expectations? Were Nkrumah too idealistic? Did we prepare the grounds for extreme dissatisfaction among the people such that we couldn't meet those expectations and those prompted those successive coup d'etats that we, we experienced? All right. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. And uh, Ni... I mean, kudos for such a fantastic uh, submission. I think for me, it was the realization that we truncated a vision and did not allow it to blossom or to bloom. And the effect of that continues to stay with us today. And I don't think that it was a problem of the vision rather than the challenge of myopia, ignorance, and inwardness, you know. The people who had a problem with the vision were not the proletariats or the masses per se. It was actually the palace boys, for want of a better expression, who felt that they, their natural place had been usurped that was the problem, you know. So it is that kind of inward jealousy, the tribal jealousy, the jealousy that does not go beyond the self and the tribe, you know. That, that was what the colonizer realized. And if you check all the functionaries in the coup, whether it is Kotoka or Frifa or even the one who was put there, um, President Buzia at the time, these were people who had had contact with the colonizer, i.e. the British, you know, and they realized that they could operate through them. And once they succeeded in the first school, once they succeeded in the first school, and let me share an interesting twist here. After I did a study on Kwame Nkrumah, 
my conclusion was that it did not make sense that the project was truncated just nine years in. Because there was nothing that proved that it had to end when it ended. Yeah. You know, so, so I have been on the search for an answer. Interestingly, interestingly, I met one old man who disclosed to me the height of Nkrumah's spirituality and the fact that in 1966, Nkrumah now moved from Christian, the Christian religion. In fact, he had a prophet who was his guide, an old prophet. He moved from that man and started consulting both functionaries of the Tijaniya movement, the traditional Islamic religion, as well as the traditional African religion, you know. So in as much as Kankanyame was a fictional creation, it was just propaganda, it had some bit of truth to it, like all of them. And as a, it is as a result of that that he fell, according to the man. And for me, it was very insightful because you cannot, and truthfully, you cannot do the kind of things that we saw Nkrumah do. You cannot do the kind of things that we are expecting any of our leaders to do if you do not have the enabling of a spirit. That is why if you check the history of kings, they're very spiritual beings, you know. And I think that it is not for nothing that Christianity held sway. It had something superior about it. it had, and when it comes to spiritual battle, in our local parlance, to which we say, Samagania Magashi and Yuhua Magahoho, you know, that if it's, it is when spiritual forces meet that we see the superior spiritual force. And I believe that people did not just move to join Christianity. They saw a certain power. They saw a certain result. They saw that it could overcome the, th- the powerful people that they had feared over time. You know, it held a certain force of truth. And to the extent that the old man's account is true, then that gives us an insight. And for us as young people who are very idealistic and we want to go on some path of bringing some liberation to our spaces, we probably want to be minded to look at that aspect as well. But Nkrumah was somebody who thought very scientifically. And that is why it is very difficult to fault his writings, his thoughts, his ideas, and all of yeah. that. And in as much as people easily jump and say that, oh, uh, Nkrumah was a socialist. Economically, actually, he was a scientific socialist. Okay. That was his, yeah, that was his description of his own self. And he was also very pragmatic. For example... Yeah. When he became president and he realized that we needed to take control of our economy, he bought the foreign companies at the stock exchange price. He didn't do what Mugabe did in 2006, just okay. nationalizing them. He bought them off at the stock exchange price. And that should tell you that the West will caricaturize any and everything that does not inure to their benefit. Yeah. Yes, because if you had a company and its value, was there and I offered you money for that value and took the and took the company. I think that is fair. Yeah. You know, yeah, okay. and economies like China today proves Nkrumah right a thousand times. That's true. Yes. That's you know, true. It, and I heard Xi Jinping, I think two days ago, talk about social socialist capital. That in a socialist state, you can actually generate a certain form of capital, which is quite different from that of the Western states, which is a straight capitalist uh, model. You know, so all of these are things that we need to tease and to seek to understand so that it informs how we conduct ourselves. To know that the one whom Nkrumah called our enemy and detractors, our enemies and detractors, yeah. if the West had anything good for us, I'm sure the past 66 years or the past 56 years post Nkrumah should prove that we should be everywhere. We should be on top of Africa today because we've been darling boys of yeah. the West. You know? yeah. And when I did a tracing, you would realize that Archbishop Duncan Williams founded his church in 1979. That okay. was when the late uh, a champion was overthrown, right? Yeah. Now, the history has said that after his training by Apostle Ida, Benson Idahosa, yeah. 
he asked him to come. And at the time, because of the nature of state media, it was only state media we had, to okay. come and talk to the president that he, Archbishop, has asked him to permit him to preach the gospel on national television. Okay. A champion refused him. He took the report back. And a champion sent him to come and tell him that within one month, he gives him one month, he will be overthrown. In exactly one month, that was when the coup happened. Wow. Now, when Jerry Rollins came, and Jerry Rollins was no Christian. I mean, he was an, a, a traditionalist till he died. We all know that it's public knowledge, even though he associated with the Catholic Church. The same letter was brought to Jerry Rollins. And somebody who knew what had happened between Archbishop and a champion advised Rollins that we know that you don't like this religion, but this was what happened to your predecessor. Rollins okay. then accepted and allowed him to preach on national television. Wow. So when we were kids, the only church that had presence on national television was Archbishop Duncan Williams. If you remember Sundays at 7 a.m. Okay. You know, and yeah. that is for me, that revelation was very interesting. Now, Archbishop okay. started off the charismatic movement with a prayer revolution, if you may, or a prayer revival. Yeah. It was actually, according to church history, on the back of that intercessory movement that we were ushered into democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then by 1994, 1994, the Aglo Women's Movement yeah. also was formed. And they will have a movement so wide that they had market chapters. Yeah. And so if you see the smooth transition in 2000, which was not expected by yeah. anybody, you still see the significance of this particular spiritual movement or the religion, all right, in all of these facets. And I think that to the extent that we've had people who only speak to Christianity but are not necessarily godly because godliness is seen in your actions, I think that explains yeah. a lot of why we continue to be where we are, irrespective of the abundance of knowledge that is with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, this this gives me a much deeper understanding of exactly at what point religion began to, to play, uh, Christianity to be specific, and spirituality began to play a crucial role in, in sustaining the kind of smooth transitions that we saw. Um, I would like to conclude this session, this segment with Karim. Um, the years that followed our independence, even till now, uh, we've seen like lots of politicians dreaming big, being overly ambitious uh, and risking to reach very, very high heights. Not just because they want to impress the population, but also because I think looking back, the standards and the heights that we set to reach during the liberation struggle are things that a lot of people still believe we are yet to get there. And so politicians are in some way pressured to, to, to try and get there. And to me, I feel it doesn't give in the country the kind of gradual development that we owe to ourselves to give timely expectations of where we ought to be. Is, is this the case, in your opinion? And what are your thoughts also on how the liberation movement has also affected the kind of political systems we have to be? Well, thank you, Andrews. And, and just before I, I come on to, to that, that question that you just asked, just yes, because um, we, we all seem to have been having a very smooth conversation and pretty much towing the same line. Uh, my spirit is really, really struggling with that. So let me take on uh, <laughs> briefly <laughs> what, what my senior carriage just, just said. And, 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 and I guess if, if one could trace the 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 whole the power the influence of faith um to to the point that um senior courage just just made i guess it would also help one to understand why the the religious fraternity has largely become such a problematic institution in this country and i i have said this time and again i've said it on my radio show i've said it on on literally every platform that i've had that when we have a clear case of embezzlement, misgovernance, corruption, and, and sometimes the lack of 
um, commitment to, to, to promote the sort of ideas that we need to develop among other things. If you have all of that and we don't get our very powerful religious leaders, some of whom could, as we are learning, I didn't know about this, as we are learning, some of whom could tell um, I mean, leaders of this country that if they did not allow them to, to preach or to proselytize, they could be overthrown, and indeed they were overthrown. Then I guess it explains the kind of, um, I mean, perhaps a blackmail, if I want to put it that way, and, and stranglehold that faith and religious institutions or personalities have on the state. Because when I see that our city is struggling for very obvious reasons, and then a man of God so powerful, who has some of the most powerful people in this country sit at the front pew of his church, come and rather pray for the Ghana city to rise, then we have a problem. Because what that does is that for some of these very influential people, their, their acts obfuscates the real problems that we have. But of course, when you raise the people, we say that, well, they are spiritual people, and for that matter, leave them to talk about their spirituality. But that is also perhaps that's why we are where we are. But, but let me talk more about the, this, this bit about the transition, right? And why we, we seem to have had um, truncation all across. And me, me touched on that in some part. But the other aspect of this, and, and I, when I say this, I do not in any way, for instance, excuse the, 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 the problems of Nkrumah himself. But because you want to understand why the independence promises didn't seem to, um, I mean, reach its final destination, if you want to understand that context, then you must want to listen to this a bit more because they, we need to understand that there are interests at play, okay? And, and the, the independent struggle, as we have come to know, did not come cheap. People died. People fought. And the colonialists themselves were not ready to, to, to relinquish power in the way that things happened. And so there were very deliberate attempts to make sure that the sort of dependence that we are seeing now would continue even at the point of, of independence. And so take this away from Ghana and look across the entire continent. You would notice that the way and manner independent struggle leaders fell out with their own people and began to have problems are pretty yeah. similar. Okay, so you would notice one thing, for instance, that the, I mean, apart from the obvious attempts to, to make things very difficult, there were, almost all of them became patrimonial. Patrimonial in the sense that big man rule, one party state, all of those things cut across. But they cut across because of some of the questions or issues that me, me raised earlier. Okay, yeah. where there is a disagreement in terms of the ideology and how to go about things, clearly we're going to see what we saw. We've seen again across many uh, other African states and including Ghana. In Ghana, when you mention it because of our current political traditions, it is very difficult because it seems like you are bashing one side against the other. But we know of the CIA involvement in and, and how they had handlers in many other uh, African states. If you go to Burkina Faso, for instance, right, uh, the likes of Blaise Campayori and, and what they did against the likes of Thomas Sankara, who comparatively were more popular, we know it. If you look at Patrice Lumumba and what he suffered again in, in, in Zaire, uh, you would notice that it's not any different. And so for all of them, there were active opposition, not in the sense of opposition as we know it today, which is merely a yeah. case of, say, contrary political tradition or views, but opposition in the sense that those from whom you have taken self-determination from have every yeah. reason to not allow you continue on that tangent, right? And, and that is why, if you look at, just to round up on this one, if you look at some of the things that we, today we are talking about, our, about our ability to, to, to self-rule international financial systems that our current president has been speaking about and against, yeah. if you look at the, our production, the fact that we are still very much raw material based among many other things. These are clear things that if you departed from, you could end up in trouble. And so if you wanted to governize and consolidate the power and the authority to be able to do all of these things, you are very likely going to have a problem with all of those who, one, 
either, either disagree with you for the sake of it, or two, are influenced by some other powers who may not exactly be interested in how the trajectory that you were going. And for me, these things explain to a very large extent the sort of patrimonialism that we came to see on the African continent, because by yeah. itself, it became some sort of a self-defense mechanism by these yeah. independent uh, struggle leaders because they needed to, as it were, protect whatever it is that they had. And today, I think that history would vindicate them because the reality of our world today suggests that that campaign failed and, and yeah. because it failed, that's why we are still where we are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is very interesting, especially putting a different perspective on why um, some of these leaders would have would have done the kind of things that they did. Because growing up, you you barely hear different perspectives of the story being shared. And a lot of times we are tunnel visioned into just listening to one side, either painting them as bad, trying to um, limit the extent to which their rationale played into the kind of decisions that they made. And to be very honest, this has been a very, very good evening listening to the contributions on here. And so this is the end of the third segment. Now nearing the end, before we go to the final segment with Selom, um, we'll be taking a maximum of five questions, um, about three to five questions after the segment. So you can um, put your questions, um, tweet it under the, the space, and then I would read them out for our panelists to address them. We will pick three to five questions. So just do that ASAP if you have any questions. Selom, over to you. Thank you very much for that, Andy. And to our final segment, which I find really intriguing, I do think that from where, when we were able to start understanding what independence meant to us as a Benin, we've always focused on learning how to match properly to our pin straight iron uniforms and always trying to present ourselves a certain way whenever we have our independence celebration day coming. I'd like now to invite our speakers to just give us some insight on what independence day celebration should be to us as Ghanaians, apart from ironing our uniforms to be as straight as possible and going to the park to match the whole day. Let's start with Karim. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very interesting one. I like how you put it. Um, I, I seriously do not know if there is any good to defend when it comes to how to celebrate our independence. I do appreciate the essence of, 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 of recognizing uh, where we have come from and not also losing the sort of relationship, for want of a better expression, we have with those who otherwise, uh, um, I mean, we did not have self-determination or were not as humans as they consider themselves. But of course, I appreciate the point of the question. So I'll just go ahead and, and tell you what I think. And I, I think that the way that we conceptualize this idea of, of independence and freedom, and that goes back to what um, Courage mentioned earlier, even about the terminologies that we use and all of that. And, and for me, the fact that we continue to spend and, and also dedicate a great deal of our efforts and our resources into to aesthetics of what independence looks like. So, so for instance, to, we, we know that this year, the, the national grand celebration is going to be um, in, uh, held in Ho. In this period, I've seen photos and videos from Ho. The amount of work ongoing at the Ho Sports Stadium and, and the attempt to facelift that entire space to sort of create this facade that appeals to the imperial president that we have and the many people who will come around them is precisely the problem with, with how we think about independence. Of course, you would hear people say, for instance, that, oh, if you had the money, use it for something else and all of that. I'm not so keen about that. But what is the point of independence if up to today, right? Um, just simply wanting to get 
professional legal education to become a lawyer, to take up a role that we so desperately need in this country. Why is it so difficult to, to do that? Why do we continue to maintain the same elite establishment and ranks that essentially box people out and create exclusive zones for only people of certain class or people who suffer a great deal before they are able to access any of those things? Why is it, for instance, that we can have a chief justice who, for their own lack of awareness, would tell, for instance, a, a professor of African studies who appears before the Supreme Court to, to testify on a matter that he was not properly dressed because he was not wearing the suit. We are wearing wigs, dirty wigs that the British people have themselves uh, discarded. Like there are just so many things, right? So many things that oftentimes will fall within the realms of decolonization that we must continue to, to fight and to drum home in order to at least have any semblance at all of what this independence of freedom looks like. So you know what? I, I would appreciate that even if we we're at all going to do anything on, on safe match, right, just for the sake of commemoration, right, I, I, I would want to see something more material other than having a bunch of young people come stand in the sun and some of them faint all over the country and, and will match and salute authority and pretty much that ends it. Right. So, so for me, it, it, it's just a difficult thing because sometimes you ask yourself, where exactly do we start from? Right. So there's nothing about the idea of independence, the way we conceptualize it, the way we seem to want to actualize it. That that gives me any impression that we understand what exactly it is that we are talking about or have that sort of independence or freedom that, that we think we, 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 are, we, are, we are fighting for. And so for me, just to end, end, end again on, on this, independence would mean different things for different people, and I appreciate that. But until such a period, because it was only recently that we, I don't know if it is not there anymore, but, but we have had to learn things like the benefits of colonialism in our, in our schools, right? We're very, very, very uncritical of just so many things that oftentimes when you raise them, you begin to sound like a broken record, like the guy who is always talking about Africa and Pan-Africanism, what does it mean, and all the sort of rubbish that you, 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 you get to hear from people. So at the end of the day, really, I mean, what has significantly changed, right? The only thing that we are able to do today is we, we, we elect, that is if we actually do, uh, people who look like us. But in terms of what they believe, their own ideologies, among other things, it is not any different. We're still subscribing to the same international I mean, systems, like international financial system, the, the World Trade Organization, among many other things, with the same rules that creates a certain distinction, a primus inter pares between the rest of us and the rest of them up there in the, in, in the rest of the world. Final bit is to say that if you take, for instance, this Russia-Ukraine conflict or war that that has got everybody talking and sometimes even here in Ghana, we use it as grounds for why we are in the economic mess that we are in today. If you look at all of that, the notion that some countries are different and special as opposed to others, right? Which creates this order of say the Security Council. If you look at that, sometimes you ask yourself, why is it that we seem to be surprised that Russia can just wake up one day and invade Ukraine and do what they are doing? Because other people do it. We've seen them do it in Libya. We've seen them do it in Afghanistan. We've seen them do it in many other places. And for me, there was a time that we have, we have pride. That pride spoke to the independence that we had. When we were part of non-aligned movement and we were strong and we were always advocating for some of these things and fighting against the establishment. Today, what do we do? Well, our president, who goes to Washington and goes to literally, literally snatch they are, they are uh, our, our compatriots in, in Burkina Faso. Of course, the problem that we are seeing there is big and we need to do something about it. But when we were happy running to the dead um, queen of England, who at the time of, of marriage, and I should say at the time of, if we want to believe that she did not have sex before marriage, at the time of having sex, <laughs> first time having sex, consummating her marriage, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Salom, your grandfather, 
was was still a, a subject of hers because she was the leader of this country somehow. But we haven't moved away from Commonwealth. We haven't departed from Commonwealth in any way. So literally every single thing that gives you the, the self-determination that you want, that gives you the impression or any semblance of freedom, none of that has gone away. But I appreciate mm-hmm. that it is difficult. And those who attempted to fight those things were overthrown, were killed, were handicapped in many ways. But for me, that is where the, the true independence of freedom begins from. And until we, we get into those kinds of conversations, normalize them and begin to participate in them, I'm sorry, but those who collapse at the independence, they will collapse for nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I ended there. Thank you very there. much. <laughs> Thank you very much for that insightful take, Karen. Picking up from something that I found very intriguing in what you said with regards to how the way we celebrate independence does not necessarily show that we understand what independence should actually mean to us as individuals or citizens of a post-colonial state. I'm just going to ask me, Along the same lines, what does Independence Day celebration mean to you? And do you think that we should necessarily fight for an overhauling of the educational system so that we have an inclusion of what independence should mean to kids and how they should be able to conceptualize the idea of living in a post-colonial state that was fought for by forefathers that put in all their best? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I was trying to pull up my African genius speech, which is the my go-to material anytime this question pops up. But I think I can I can find it here. On in 1958, Nkrumah said what we should hope to achieve. He said we need a new type of citizen, a dedicated, modest, honest, and informed man, a man that submerges himself. To, man, to the service of the nation, to mankind. A man who abhors greed and detests vanity. A new type of man whose humility is his strength and whose integrity is his weakness. Then, a few years later, at the opening of the University of East Africa, he said, to become African in a meaningful way, a university has to transform itself from a pure reflection of alien universities into a living, concrete symbol of all that is African. Independence Day should not i think it's just a jamboree it's just a performance it's kind of like a, a highlight of, of of theatrics to look for a better word 67 66 years after after one year we're having conversations we're asking questions what is the whole idea of this we have we were in a state of colonialism political economic cultural probably mental or even religious. And so we got out of the political aspect of it, which we celebrate. But we should ask ourselves other questions. Have we gotten out of the economic colonialism? Have we gotten out of the cultural colonialism? And especially to your your question, have we gotten out of the mental colonialism? I feel the people who have, one of the people who have greatly failed are the universities. The universities were supposed to be the forefront of of the anti-colonial struggle. But from the word go, especially the University of Ghana, it seems they have, not not, not to say that they have no country, but it seems the universities haven't put in the forefront that we expected of them to do in the anti-colonial struggle. This is a, this is, we are talking about times and institutions where the university put up um, a statue, a, 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 a statue for Gandhi. At a point in time in the world where Cecil Rhodes was falling, at a point in time in the world where there was knowledge going against the idea of Mongo Park finding Nigeria, at a time in the world where all those monuments of colonial ideology were falling, University of Ghana was raising a statute in honor of Mahatma Gandhi, who had done nothing, and even in his time in living in Africa, was known to be a racist. What has been the way we have oriented ourselves? Karim was just saying, I perfectly agree with Karim, that we, was, we just had a year or two ago, we had a, 
chief justice who was sitting and telling a professor why he's dressed quote unquote in African clothing. How have her intelligentsia, how have the most educated people taking us out of the conundrums of 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 mental colonialism? I mean Bob Mali quoting the words of Marcus Gavi said we should emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. This is the most, this is the things we should be asking ourselves. What are we going to celebrate after 66 years? Well, how are we thinking? What language are we speaking? What is the future of our country? Where are we now in global affairs? Are we where we wanted to be? I feel Independence Day should be a lot of questioning that we should be questioning ourselves. The, 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 the thing around the whole country, where every DC, and there's even bigger than just where the president is going to be. Probably every DC, every MMC is going to have a park somewhere where basic school children are going to stand and march. That shouldn't be a significant bill. But independence should have us more questioning ourselves more. It is sad that after 66 years, we have to have a month where we intentionally want to become ourselves, where we watch TV and people want to wear our clothes and people have to speak, are forced to speak our language and people and kids in international schools mimic what they, 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 they term backwardness because in one breath, you have a pastor with a large congregation telling people that it's backward to be using pistol and mortar to pound for in another breath, it is, there's an international school mimicking probably what we'll never do in an African We should ask ourselves what it means to be Ghanaian. That is the fundamental question. What does it mean to be Ghanaian? What are we independent of? Because we are still, as and now, we are still begging, if there's for the availability of a better way, for a debt exchange program, which means we are not independent economically. Culturally, what, are we, what have we done to get out of this? We had to, some years ago, we had to consciously tell ourselves to put on African prints, probably made in Netherlands or somewhere imported from, from China somewhere to even symbolize our cultural nationality. We have, when the worst of all, the part that hits me the most is we had a, we had a perfect opportunity to tell our story of what our independence and what our journey of a country has been on our currency notes, which is the big way of telling our advantage. When I was young, we had a thousand notes, two thousand notes, which signified the collective history of our country. It had women like Nandidi Ashkashka on it. It had men like Ephraim Amo on the 20,000 city notes. It had people who, it had cocoa farmers. It had things of people who had played their roles. But on our five or six currency notes right now, we have minimized and limited the the, the, the celebration of the builders and final, the foundational builders of our nation to six people, five of whom probably were our beneficiaries of being in a certain place at a certain time and the conjoining of history. So we should ask ourselves these questions. What does it mean to be Ghanaian? How are we celebrated? Is our, is our history limited? What has happened to people like Kwabna Boni? What has happened to people like Ellen Dove? What has happened to people like Sofa Atoku? What has happened to people like Hanakuju? To, the, to, the, to, to, to sportsmen who have played their roles? To people like uh, Akushika Sisika Akwe? To, to, to previous judges in Supreme Court to have helped us get it. And so independence should be a time of reflection how far we have come and where we want to go to. And it goes back to the point of ideology. Mm -hmm. What is the thinking of our nation? Probably tomorrow we'll have political statements and then that will be it till next year where we go to another place and then do the whole jamboree again. And so we are not, probably we are not fulfilling our independence celebration in a way we should. It should mean it should mean more to Ghanaian than people living outside the country posting Ghana flags or everybody posting Ghana flags and probably doing nothing Ghanaian again till next mm -hmm. year. It should mean more than churches putting one Sunday aside to have people wear cultural Sunday and then bastardizing everything about the culture of the people after. Mm -hmm. The independence of our people of us should feel cultural, feel a sense of this is the Ghana that was supposed to be there way to Africa. This is the Ghana that was supposed to be the shining example. Fine, I end with what the sermon Martin Luther King preached. He, he preached of a new nation. And if you read the new nation sermon and read the passion with which Martin Luther King preached, the motivation it gave him to go on with the civil rights movement, 
before there was the year of return in the 50s and 60s, almost everybody who mattered in black civilization history was in Ghana because it meant something of identity to the people. Ghana shouldn't just mean coming here in December to look at forts and castles and jamming to concerts. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Jean. Really appreciate that input. And finally, to you, Courage, on the same question, but with a focus on whether you think we should reorient how we view independence based on an overhauling of the educational system to make sure that kids from a young age do actually understand what this independence means to us and when they are growing, they carry that understanding with them. Thank you very much, Selo. And um, I think I'll pick it from this angle. The symbolism of Independence Day March was very right and powerful when it started because it was not a standalone activity. If you check from the curriculum at the time to organizations like the Young Pioneers Movement and all of that, there was a certain consciousness that was being built to liberate the minds of the young people in particular, you know. And so the march was just part of a symbol of drumming it home to a people of a sense of their new reality. You know, so at the time it wasn't. But if you ask me whether today we should put young people on the street, on the sun too much, I'll tell you it is absolutely unnecessary. Why is it so? We have failed at doing the mental liberation. So again, this has become like a mere entertainment or a mere ritual that means nothing in terms of its true significance to the mind of the young people. And how has, uh, have we come here? After Nkrumah's overthrow, you had places like the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana build an anti-Nkroma scholarship. If you check the New Year School public lectures that happened in 67, 68, 69, and all of that, it, it is absolutely terrible. And so that anti-Nkroma sentiment now makes it very difficult for people who are holding that consciousness to actually act consciously against the colonizer. Because you cannot love Nkrumah and love the British or the colonizer at the same time. And so you can't hate Nkrumah and hate the British at the same time. And that psychological dissonance is what informed that movement. Hence, the first train of this whole lie of a big sis on a, 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 a people. And it is still in advancing that agenda that we see what he was complaining about. Stamp bases everywhere, everywhere. Just create it like a mnemonic. Paste it in everybody's face, in all the, on all the currencies. Why? Because it lacks the force of truth. You know, if you come to our educational system, in fact, growing up, I hated Nkrumah until high school when I started reading about him. Because almost everything that we're told was negative and all of that. And yet whether it is industries or road infrastructure, education infrastructure, everything, even up to today that we still continue to build on, was set up by this man. And it was that, that disparity that caught me to say, you know what, forget about whatever they've told me and all that. Let me start reading. And that was when I fell in love with the man. So the real work is in the mental liberation. There's another, another development that we've not alluded our mind to. The top... 1%, and now it's even about 5% of the Ghanaian society, their children don't take the Ghanaian curriculum. I, I, I used to teach in the IB curriculum. IB curriculum, I used to teach in the IGCSE, which is the British Cambridge curriculum. It is all Western history. It is centered on Western history. There's practically anything, nothing. In fact, it took some of us, like I was teaching literature in the IB curriculum, so I then selected books of Amar Taidu and others to counter that narrative. You know, when you look at those people, when they grow up, when they complete school, 
they don't school here in Ghana. 95% of them go abroad. So you have a group of people who are totally and completely disconnected from the Ghanaian space. Now come back after school and because their fathers and mothers are well placed in society, they fix them in charge of institutions. So the level of disconnect is very, very high. And so until we come to a time where we even insist that as a core, as a core of our educational curriculum, there should be something called um, national history or something, or African perspectives, you know, or Ghanaian perspectives that is a core, whatever you read, whether science or art or business, whatever, you take it just like we take English, for example, which is de deliberately developed to inculcate the sense of our history truthfully for what it is, and then the kind of African thinking, the kind of psychological buildup that will be required. Then it will continue to be these uh, meaningless ceremonies, meaningless celebrations. And of course, for the contemporary politician, it's a low hanging fruit. You know, um, a, a lot of the reason why some of these parades are conducted is actually purely for the budget that will be developed and, and the procurement that will have to go with it fraught with all manner of uh, corruption and wrongdoing. That is why they would insist that it be done. For example, if you ask me, it does not make sense that tomorrow we are going to celebrate independence. What exactly are we celebrating? What exactly? Is it a domestic debt exchange? <laughs> Which is also something that I'm very happy happened. I'm very happy because one other thing that was happening is that you had in W.B. Du Bois' concept of the talented tent that every society that has developed has developed on the back of its top 10 percent, top 10 talented percent. That makes up the ruling class and the upper middle class, if you may. In Ghana, what happens is that they make money, whether legitimate or illegitimate, they stash it in bonds and they live on the dividends of those monies, what we call uh, uh, residual income or uh, how do you, passive income. So when it comes to real business, real running of things, they don't do that. So somebody stacks some million somewhere, every month is getting some 100,000 off of it, and you can live a comfortable life, live, the, live in East Legon. And this is the first time that those things have been attacked. And immediately those were attacked. In a matter of weeks, we saw them organize and submit about seven papers. For the first time, we have seen the elderly, retired judges and others picketing. What they have been telling us, the young people, that it is undesirable, it's not something to do. And so if we are minded to dialectically, you know, analyze the happenings, and we realize that it is not all unfortunate. And that will probably begin the process where, but as individuals, if let us commit ourselves as young people to truly understanding our history, that is where liberation will come from. Then this independence will probably become meaningful. And then when, for example, Selom is in charge of Ministry of Education in the next five or 10 years, the activities that she would organize will not reflect what we are seeing today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, thank you very much. I think that concludes the major segments of the discussion. Um, finally, we'll just take up a few questions. Um, I've seen some questions under the tweet. I've created them. So just to wrap up the session, we'll just give every... Um, I'll direct one question to a speaker to address, and then you take about one to two minutes to quickly address that, and then we can move on from there. All right. So... The first question I would be reading out is from Jamai Akins, who says, um, I think the biggest question now is, does Ghana or Africa still have what it takes to break free from external powers once and for all? Or we are going to continue to analyze how our forefathers were bottled easily? And um, Karim, can you take this up, please, uh, in about a minute or two? Give him a short answer. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the oftentimes the biggest 
charge against um, Pan-Africanists especially because uh, the point is that it, it appears that everything is so steeped in, in history. And so it is very difficult for, for young people today, particularly also because of how globalized we have all become to fully appreciate this context and nuance. And so, yes, it's a difficult thing. I, the answer to this can never be a no, right? It, it cannot be a no that, that we can't do things for ourselves. But what is also important is that you cannot embark on this kind of liberation struggle if you also don't know what you are about. So it's obviously a very, very slow process. And, and, and for me, conversations like this, oftentimes people don't think that these are very important. Today, maybe someone might have learned something new. Um, someone might have been engaged on something that um, they used to have a certain pushback on. Maybe today they have, they have taken a different position. Even for what we have discussed also, there may be some who are still not, uh, I mean, convinced. All of that is very important. What, what at the heart of it for me is that even for you as the individual, always strive to ask questions and to, and to wonder really, why is it that on almost everything in this world, some other group of people's approach, orientation, philosophy, belief is projected to be superior than yours. Yeah. Even to the point where you yourself have come to accept those kinds of things. I think that if we begin to ask those questions, we'll, we'll build up to some point, right? Because it's obviously not going to be a very easy thing to wake up one day and change everything. Even if you did that yeah. today, you won't obviously get the masses to be in support because we have all been conditioned and socialized in a certain way. So gradual, these kinds of conversations, our own individual learnings and all of that would ultimately push you into that position where you can do things in a way that makes you believe that, well, indeed, today I'm doing better, today I am, I am far better than it used to be, and not always rely on some historical efforts and accounts, however much important they are. Yeah, um, thank you very much. So I'll direct this question to me, um, which is from Frank Bannerman. And he says, how do we reconcile the very clearly resistant generation that fought for independence of Ghana and the current generation who hardly actively protest despite very bad economic and social situation of Ghana? What happened and what went wrong? What changed about it? And I think, <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, I think we've had over the years, if you, if you chronicle the liberation movements, the, the, the liberation movements of Ghana, you realize that post, even post-independence, you've had strong liberation movements, whether positively or negatively. So we had strong, especially the students' movements, very strong. NUCS has been a very strong instrumental pillar of our society from student activism in secondary schools. Because when you want to read, um, once you get to secondary school, they tell you the SRC does you for youth for progress and that they resisted student changes, blah, blah, blah. You read a lot of literature on even university students and the role university students have played in the 70s. The role university students played that Bruce Rollins. They let the blood flow of 1979 when he came back and the, the support he got in 1982 and how the youth even flipped against Rollins in the late 80s into the 90s when they realized that oh, he's, he's going against most of the things he said. But into the Early into the 21st century, the 2000s and the 2001, something happened. Um, most of the youth who were vocal, vociferous student leaders in the 90s, in late, late 80s, 90s, early 2000s, then moved into political power. And what they do is that they have infiltrated the universities, what was a united um, in, uh, university student society with nooks into political unions, so now there's an NDC news and an MPP news, and more than an efficient SRC in the student bodies, they have now have things in test schools, which always fight for these positions. Then what took over was the traditional councils of the halls. So you go to University of Ghana, you go to Tech, they had Kwantanga, Kunti, standing up for students' rights, CASFO doing that in UCC, standing up for students' rights. And now these rights have either been infiltrated sometimes by people who don't understand what is going on but only like the exuberance of it or face 10 resistance from university administrators who know who 
know the, the potential and the what the people have to cause reforms. And so I vehemently <laughs> against it. So you have political science lecturers who, for some reason, have some hypothetical way of wanting resistance and liberation and protest to happen, but realistically can't stand protest happening on the ground. And so you come to tech where students are where students have some kind of end such treatment. But yeah. once the students protest, the students, the university doesn't end up the same again and it goes to reach the cross levels of victimization. Any student who wants to protest now, genuinely, you face serious victimization from university officials who probably in their time didn't give any two hoots about what was going on, but are beneficiaries of protest movements that have gone down. The people running the system nowadays are people who protested against eating chicken too much in the university, can't even feed students on a cup of tea a day. And so it should tell you that how far we have come, but all, all hope is not lost. We should take inspiration from what happened in Nigeria a few years ago. We should take inspiration from what happened in Namibia in 2020. We should take inspiration from what happened in South African universities in um, just about 10 years ago where serious student liberations are moving on. I believe that liberation movements can never be shut down. I am. Yeah. I believe that students can never be gagged. The more you gag people, it's, 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 uh, and as Yotuma says, it's like pressing water for, down. The people might be quiet, but one day they will strike, and the day they strike, it would not be, it would not be a pleasant thing. Personally, I believe universities, especially, should have the ideology of, it is better to have an overly exuberant, loud student body than to have an apathetic, quiet student body. Because an overly loud student body can be trimmed into better and vibrant vocal citizens who have the interest of their nation at heart and would always yeah. have their attention at heart. But a quiet, apathetic student body would embrace ignorance, hard mediocrity, and be an instrument of tools for shambolic leadership. And that is the direction we are going in. So university students, anytime, at any point in time, should always rise up. Should, there, should be, there should be some courage. You should be, uh, they should be encouraged to better shout. Things like debating should never stop. All these, the, the, the students should always be motivated. They should be motivated by things that have happened in the past and, yeah. and plan for the future. Better, I repeat, better a loud, exuberant student's body than a, another apathetic, quiet, and fearful student's body. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the third question is from Colin Stetter, um, who asks, there is no doubt Ghana's future is hinged on the opportunities that will be created for young people in the next few years. Why are there no opportunities for the youth? Um, Courage, I think you take this one before we answer the final question. All right, thank you very much, uh, Andy. I think the question as to why there aren't more opportunities created for the youth is the same question that our forefathers answered. Why are we not ruling ourselves? And why are, is the colonizer the one ruling us? And so I think Nin just alluded to the National Students Front. You know, I was a NUCS uh, secretary in 2012, in, in my final year in school. And post that time, you realize that what he spoke to, the political parties now have presence on the campuses and that presence has now hijacked the entire student's uh, movement. So the ruling class or the elderly are always looking for any and every opportunity to stifle young people because they know the capacity of our energies. So it would take a generation of young people who have committed themselves to building capacity to be necessarily different from the existing order. Developed a deep understanding of the society and loyalty to their ideas and to the nation. Now, when this sort of force now arises, freedom has never been given, as Nkrumah said, it's always been fought for and taken and they'll have no option than to do so. We are seeing a form of it in Nigeria, where the young people stood up for the first time and said, that, no, we want governance that reflects who we are. 
and they are pressing on. And it looks, from what I am seeing, I've been following steadily, victory is in sight. Victory is in sight. In fact, the same old establishment people who do all the political things to rig and everything are now begging after having them because they realize that the youth are unrelenting. But they are like that because their loyalties are not necessarily to the systems. Their loyalties are to a nation and to ideas that they have in their mind as to what Nigeria should be. I think that is where it lies. And this kind of thing, if you are to begin anything, would have to begin from the formative years, the high schools, so that before the young people even get to the tertiary level, they have a certain set of ideas and ideals that guide them, that guide their lifestyle. I, for example, I mean, I'm a politician. I'm with the NPP. But when I was on campus, Tescon annoyed me. I was never a part of it. In as much as I like the NPP and I associate it because ideologically, I believed that the way they are structured is anti-progress. It's anti-progressive. So I think that is where it begins, that mental liberation. So conversations like this on platforms like this are very progressive. But if we can sink it down to the younger population, that is where we will now have a groundswell of young people who begin to press for, fight for, and take their rightful place in society. And that is when we will be able to have some meaningful progress. Thank you. That's, that's a great answer. Um, all the answers I'm getting are very insightful. Final question comes from Kwesi Tando, and I will direct this to you, Karim, and so you get to wrap this up. And he says, from where we find ourselves now, what are the practical ways out? Who should execute this, these practical ways? Should we wait for a second in Chroma to return from the diaspora to save the day again? Or we cook our model as China and others have done? <laughs> it's, a, it's a practically impossible question to answer practically. And <laughs> I say so because... Um, so it, it, it comes up a lot. Who must do what? But I think it, it will start from, from, from all of us, really. Because I, I do not imagine that you are, you are going to have anyone come from anywhere. I actually reject the idea that uh, somehow you would need someone else with the experience from another world to, to come and change anything. And, and it is also very unlikely because today, the kind of world that we have all created for ourselves or we are participating in, this seemingly, I mean, um, slow yet sure approximation towards a certain globalized society. The attempt to create the impression that uh, individual entities do not matter, but when in actual fact, in terms of, say, the, the global kick, we are, we are not experiencing it very, uh, equally. So, so I, I am not sure if someone would go to uh, because we have seen those who have gone to Yale and Columbia and Harvard, and they haven't proven to be any different from the problems that we have. What I really do believe is that when you have the opportunity, and by opportunity, I do not mean that you are sitting on a platform like this or you're on TV or anywhere. When you have the opportunity in your own small space, what kinds of things are you asking? And, and today, I'm very happy that, um, I mean, Senior Courage has been on, and and I'm sure for many of you, if he doesn't repeat himself time and again, you might not be able to tell that he belongs to a certain political tradition in Ghana. And for me, that is important. It is okay to support whichever political entity that you want to, to support. And, and I'm narrowing it in on politics because as it stands today, it appears to be, as Ni mentioned also earlier, perhaps the, the most functional institution or institutions that we have in Ghana, like it or not, our political parties are very strong, their machinery is working very well and all of that. But as we have seen, any time that we galvanize support for specific causes, we get some reaction. So today, whether we like it or not, Article 71 holders and their, their uh, I mean, emoluments would be a very important subject for the next election here in Ghana. Because we have we have lamented about those things for a while now that we have seen one of the political leaders, a prospective president in the name of John Berawani Mahama, saying that he will cancel it. If you look at free senior high school policy, for instance, it became what it has become simply because 
someone took it up. And then also there was a lot of public support among other things for it. There have been, I mean, agitations for a new constitution by many groups, including more recently Fix the Country. What kind of contribution are we all making to that debate? You don't necessarily have to go and, and, and join them. If you join them, that would be great. But what are you doing in your own small space? So for me, as a journalist, maybe until recently, anybody who listens to me on radio would know where exactly I stand on all of these matters and, and the kind of I mean, interest that I bring to bear when we are discussing our national problems and all of that. I can talk. If you leave me the whole day, I can talk. And so I, have, I, I use what I have to, to make a certain point. Of course, I know it is difficult when you look at it with a certain destination in mind, okay? It, 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 it almost seems like it is impossible. So when I'm doing my bit, I'm not doing it because I'm seeing myself as the nest of Sajifu or anything like that. That would be completely, I mean, I mean very illusional for anybody to, to think that way. But I just think that practically, practically, because we cannot wake up one morning and kumbaya, everybody believes in one thing. The most important thing is that what can we all do in our own respective positions? And the most important thing at, in, in all of this for me is that we must ask questions. We must, we must make people uncomfortable, right? So, so sometimes, even if it means playing the devil's advocate, do it. Someone says that, well, in Ghana, and I'll go back to law education because it's the subject that we can all be very, very familiar with. If someone says that, oh, uh, if we allow a lot of people to get into Makola, the quality of, of legal education would go down. Even if you believe that, ask some questions, right? In the United States of America, they are, they are producing thousands every year. Why do we not have a, a, a terrible legal system? What about our own it makes it such an exclusive enclave that only a few people can benefit from? We must ask questions, right? You may be benefiting from the system that you have and perhaps it is very difficult to almost all of a sudden depart from it. But ask questions, right? If if you support the NDC and John Dramani Mahama wants to come back, right? Ask questions. And for me, that is where it begins. Because if anybody expects that someone is going to wake up one day and and come and liberate the, 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 the country, I mean, it's not going to happen. And, and the same thing that happened to Nkrumah, Nyerere, Sankara, Lumumba, and all of it, it will happen to you again today. So... Yeah. It must it must begin from all of us. We must do our own bit in our small ways to help with the conversation, to help with the education. Because when people don't buy into it, there's very little that you can do. And for me, that is where it starts. That's where the advocacy really, really starts. And we must do our own bit. And and if you have any other thing to, to add as an individual, you obviously can can add that because the, the knowledge and the wisdom cannot come from only one person, really. I don't believe that. Yeah, thank you very much, Karim. Um, and in conclusion, do not wait for a new Asaji for um, what are you doing in your own small space? And essentially what it means is that no space is too small. And finally, ask questions. Keep oh, asking. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, you, you have made a very important point that I cannot let go. Like this is a, this is a space. Like no space is too small, just like you have done today. So congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Karim. And thanks to everyone. Salam, I think we are done now. And with that, we've come to the end of the first episode of what promises to be an enlightening journey into Africa's past, present, and future. We'd like to thank our speakers for their powerful and insightful takes. And to our listeners, we are grateful you joined us this evening. This would not have been possible without all of you. We hope to see you in the future and please do not forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn at Dialectics for all updates on our program lineup this year. Once again, thank you all so much and I hope you have a lovely evening. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, uh, Courage. Thank you, Karim and me. Um, we will definitely talk sometime later, but a very great evening that we've had.